Caspian's Gambit, An Infinity's End Story, by Eric Warren. Narrated by Larry Gorman. Chapter 1 It must have been from an accident. As Caspian Rabot stared at the back of the man's head in front of him, all he could focus on was the long scar running from the base of the man's neck in a straight line up until it disappeared under his hairline halfway up his skull. The hair hadn't grown back over the scar, creating a very distinctive line parting the man's short brown crop. Move forward, the guard next to him called out, and the man with the scar shuffled up to the line, Cass following behind at just enough distance to stay out of his personal space. Unfortunately, the person behind him wasn't being as courteous, as a very distinctive smell wafted over Cass's senses, and he had to stamp down the urge to puke right here in the processing center. How could anyone be so blind to their own odor? Maybe the guy just didn't care enough to shower on a regular basis. Either way, Cass needed air. Next, the guard called and the man ahead of him stepped away, allowing Cass to move up to the line, where he took his first deep breath again. Caspian Brabo, the guard ahead of him said, double-checking the screen beside him. He sat at a short desk behind what Cass could only assume was a shatterproof window, staring out into the line of prisoners that had been brought in that day. The badge on his shirt indicated he was the sergeant for the secure wing of prisoners, though Cass couldn't read the name. He twisted his wrists back and forth in between the magnetic cuffs that held his hands together. This was taking forever. He hated transfer day, and so far had managed to avoid it. But everyone's luck runs out eventually. Answer him, the other guard beside Cass said. He was human, his name tag indicating he was Officer Taylor. Yeah, Cass said. Rabot, at your service. The man behind the glass grimaced, checking his screen again. Quite the fall from grace. He took a deep, satisfying breath. I guess even the best of us isn't perfect. Which is why we have to keep on our toes. Right, Mr. Taylor? Yes, sir, Taylor replied, glaring at Cass. Can't have muck like this souring the good name of the coalition. If you only knew, Cass thought. All he had to do was be patient. Though, it looks like your prior rank might still come with some privileges, the sergeant said, flipping through the text on his screen. Says here you're due for parole today, provisionally. Cass's head snapped up. Parole? He'd been sentenced for ten years, and they were letting him out after only two? What sense did that make? Surely Rutledge wouldn't have allowed it. Unless he didn't know. After everything, the coalition had come through for him after all. Taylor, please escort our special guest over to relations. He'll need to be reviewed by the parole board, the sergeant said. Come on, Taylor said, his large hand hooking around Cass's bicep and pulling him out of the line and across the wide corridor. Cass had the opportunity to glance at the large doors 200 meters away before he was pulled into a hallway. For the entire two years he'd been here, he'd never seen those doors open or close, and as far as he knew, they were the only way out of this place. The most maddening part of being here was not knowing exactly where here was. He could be on a station, a planet, a moon, or even an asteroid. He had no way of knowing without seeing out a window somewhere, and the prison had no windows. They didn't even refer to it by name which he sometimes vainly thought was for his benefit. Having been a lieutenant commander in the Sovereign Navy had allowed him a bevy of privileges, including knowing most, if not all, of the official coalition installations, including the prisons. But this place was like some kind of ghost installation, which only unnerved him further about the discoveries he'd made regarding the coalition he'd spent most of his life serving. Taylor pulled him along until Cass finally found his pace and kept up with the larger man as they reached a part of the prison Cass hadn't passed before. He was usually kept down to the stacks, where his cell was only one of a few hundred movable containers, the configuration of which was changed constantly. This had to do with the fact that the only way each cell could be opened was by inserting the entire cell into a specialized frame that deactivated the force shields around it all at once. If a prisoner was found tampering with the force shields, 
or attempting to deactivate only one part of the cell at a time, the entire system would shut down, locking them into place until they could be retrieved and punished. Cass had never been that stupid. He may not know where the prison was, but he knew how the system worked. You didn't make trouble unless you wanted to get noticed, and his name was trouble enough. He didn't need any more. Not if he wanted this nightmare to be over. In here, Taylor said, forcing him through a door as it slid open. Inside was a standard white room with nothing but a lone chair in the middle, which seemed to be molded into the floor. Cass couldn't help but wonder what the use for the species who weren't bipedal, though he hadn't seen many imprisoned here. The door behind him closed, leaving him alone, and Cass surveyed the room for a moment before taking a seat. He still couldn't figure out why he was up for parole. The terms of his court-martial had been quite clear. As soon as he sat, three images appeared on three separate walls, each of a different person. In front of him was an older human man of probably about seventy, his mustache long since gray and his head almost bald. He had beady eyes and a stern glare about him. To his right was an Utuburu, his hooded face showing no emotion at all. But of course it wouldn't, because it wasn't actually a face at all, rather a hard-like projection designed to resemble a human face. The crustacean-like Utuburu wore exoskeletons that allowed them to interact with humans and their environments without requiring special assistance. Cass had decided it was the only reason the Coalition allowed them all to wear their ceremonial robes, even while they were on duty, a luxury no other species was allowed. Finally, to his left, was a Siskian, or at least what he assumed was a Siskian. Sisk had over a dozen intelligent species, and they tended to vary wildly. Though he thought he'd seen this particular species before, and if memory served, they were one of the few humanoids from the planet. But with their eyes swept back, the lack of a nose, and only a small pinhole for a mouth, Cass had a hard time classifying them as humanoid. In his mind, they were more reptilian, without the scales. But it was best to never tell them that. Apparently, they took it as an insult. Mr. Rabot, the man in front of him began, you are here in front of this parole board today due to your excellent behavior, in addition to your previously stellar record serving the coalition, which we acknowledge and respect. But, Cass thought, but... We all know the reason you're serving out your sentence, and we certainly don't need to remind you of that fact. Before we begin, is there anything you'd like to say for yourself? Cash shook his head. Keeping a low profile meant staying as visibly humbled as possible. If this wasn't some kind of mental tactic, and they weren't trying to bait him, he might just get out of this place if he played his cards right. Do you feel like you are rehabilitated enough to re-enter civilized society? The Siskian asked, her voice coming through a translator. I feel like I can still contribute, if that's what you're asking, Cass said, doing his best to appear earnest. And it was the truth, as soon as he took care of the one who'd put him here. What I really want to know is if you feel like you've paid for your crime, she asked, the words not matching the movement of her small pinhole mouth. No, I haven't, Cass said, ready for this question at least. I don't believe any amount of time would sufficiently cover the cost of my crime. I understand people died, and I understand I was found responsible. I don't even understand why I am in front of this parole board. At least half of those statements were true. The Siskian sat back in her chair, rubbing her long fingers down her angular cheeks, which he could only assume was a sign of contemplation. If released, the Untuburu said, though the voice was like death's whisper on the wind due to the unique nature of the Untuburu's translators, what would you do? I would continue to serve the Coalition to the best of my ability. If that means I need to do maintenance on ships or clean fusion routers, I'm prepared. Interesting, the Untuburu said, turning his false face toward the man in the middle. Cass could only take this to mean they weren't sharing the same room, as he'd assumed, and the three-screen thing hadn't just been an intimidation tactic. The man in the middle glanced over at the Untuburu and then over at the Siskian, confirming Cass's suspicions about their individual locations 
You think he would be working on ships? The man of the middle asked, peering closer to the screen. Shit. He'd screwed up by assuming a convict would get to do anything so glamorous. Most were sent to planets to work under supervision. They would never be found on ships or starbases where they could interact with sensitive material. It was better if he tried not to justify or defend himself. Even admitting this mistake could show weakness where he didn't want to. Instead, he kept quiet. Perhaps because Mr. Rabot never expected to find himself in this position, he doesn't understand how it works, the Untuperu said. Yes, I could see how that would be the case. After all, how could someone who was close to commanding his own ship imagine what the parole procedures for criminals would be here on Dren? Dren. Now it all made sense. No wonder he never saw the giant doors open. Because they weren't doors. They were blast shields protecting the base from exposure to the system's star, Oxical. Dren was the first planet in the system, a mere 40 million kilometers from the star's surface. The installation had been built hundreds of years before to mine the galvanium that naturally occurred in the planet. And after it had all been mined, it had been abandoned. But because the miners had essentially hollowed out the small planet, it left a lot of room on the far side of the orbitally locked satellite. The far side always faced away from the star, while the close side was where most of the galvanium had been located. And up until that moment, Cassett believed Dren had been abandoned. When had the Coalition built this place? And who else did they keep here? The giant blast doors must be a security measure. If there was a mass breakout of any kind, they could simply open the doors and irradiate the entire population. It was sociopathic, but it would be very effective. Especially if everyone locked up in here was as bad as Cass assumed they were. You must not be a very good poker player, Mr. Rabot, the man of the middle said, smirking. Your face says it all. But don't worry. I don't see any reason to keep you on Dren any longer than necessary. He glanced to his colleagues on the other screens. Each of them gave silent movements of approval. The man turned to his side and tapped something outside of Cass's view. Caspian Rabot? As of this moment, you are on conditional parole and are ordered to report to Axis 5 for your assignment. Any violation of your parole will result in your return to Dren with a penalty of three additional years added on to your existing sentence per violation. Do you accept these terms? Cass stood from the chair, staring at the man. Without objection, he said. Chapter 2 Through the windows of the transport, Cass watched the stars fly by for the first time in over two years. Sure, he'd always found them beautiful, but there was something about the giant expanse of space itself that was more appealing. It was just so large and each little dot in the distance represented a brand new opportunity, a new race of beings, or a new scientific discovery. The point was, out here, life was limitless. Out here, it was almost as if he were infinite himself, not confined to a place or a thing or anyone else other than himself. But then he'd gone and gotten himself thrown in jail, and for the first few months he hadn't known how to deal with it. He'd never been in a place where he couldn't at least see the stars. And that had been the real punishment of living on Dren. Not the food or the boredom or the loneliness, but the very basic privilege of not seeing what he'd always taken for granted. And now, as the stars zoomed by at a thousand times the speed of light, he would never look at them without gratefulness in his heart again. Cass glanced to his right. The small transport ship was empty, except for another passenger two seats over, who they'd picked up on Axis 5. The only other soul on board was their pilot, locked behind a sturdy door in the event prisoners attempted to riot during the trip. Not that he wasn't tempted, but now wasn't the time. He needed to be patient. What do you think? Should we rush the door? Cass asked, smirking at his traveling companion. The man turned to Cass, his face set like stone. Kidding, obviously, Cass said then resumed watching the stars out the window where the man didn't respond. People needed to lighten up. He didn't know what crime the other man had committed, but if he was on this ship, it meant he was headed off for parole as well.
Shouldn't he be in a better mood? Cass, for all his faults, was feeling pretty good. Ten years cut down to two? He'd take that any day. Even if it meant he'd have to serve out a probationary period. And it wasn't as if he'd be serving out the entire thing. And after, he'd return to Starbase 8, but only briefly. He wouldn't be able to go back to Earth. Not that Dad would care. He had made it clear he didn't want to see him after the spectacle of the court-martial. No, he'd have to find another place to settle. Maybe pick up some work on a transport ship. But only after he was done on 8, after Rutledge had been exposed. It was all he'd been thinking about for the past two years. Ever since that bastard had thrown him under the proverbial bus. He should have taken his opportunity on the stand. But he'd been so shaken he hadn't even considered it. Now he was ready. He'd had time to think and prepare. This time, it would go right. Passengers, prepare for landing, the pilot said over the comm. Cass risked one more look at his companion, whose gaze remained straight ahead. He wasn't even blinking. Why was he so tense? The parole panel had been light on the details, but wherever he was being transferred, it couldn't be that bad. Certainly no worse than Dren. He leaned over. Hey, Cass whispered as the shuttle shook as it entered an atmosphere. Where are we going? The man arched an eyebrow at him. Don't you know? I thought they told officers everything. Cass pursed his lips and sat back in his seat. He'd become infamous. The trial itself had been huge, of course, broadcast over all the net channels. But he'd hoped by now at least a few people would have forgotten his face and name. But then again... The Coalition hadn't had to deal with someone like him in a long time. Maybe it wasn't so surprising then that he'd remained in the collective consciousness. He gazed back out the window to watch the atmosphere of their destination envelop the ship. The sky had a greenish-blue hue to it, which could belong to a hundred different worlds. Though the trip from Dren hadn't taken more than a few hours, so that limited the number of possibilities. The vibrations through the hull grew with intensity, as the ship lit the atmosphere on fire in its entry. White-hot flames licked the edge of Cass's window, blocking part of his view, while the ship continued to descend. As they faded, he found himself staring at a long range of sharp mountains disappearing into the distance, and in the valleys, pools of glass liquid all tinted with a yellowish-blue. The atmosphere was thick, but not so much he couldn't see into the distance. Slowly, the realization dawned on him. Oh, fuck, Cass said, leaning his head back against the headrest. He should have guessed. Look, he finally figured it out, the other man across from him said without looking at Cass. This didn't make things any easier by a long shot. Make sure your suits are sealed and check each other's equipment before stepping out, the pilot said over the comm, clearly reciting from a script he was already bored with. The Coalition will not take responsibility if your own negligence causes your deaths. The ship had touched down fifty minutes prior and had been sitting on the surface while Cass and the other passenger pulled on full mobile suits. Cathora was a Class G planet, carbon dioxide atmosphere, nitrogen rich with sulfur rain. Anything less than a full suit, and they'd be dead in minutes. Though he'd never been to Cathora before, Cass had heard the horror stories. The first settlers had given their lives just to establish the very basic protections on the surface, and it had taken another twelve years before the situation had become tolerable with the installation of permanent force shields and environmental simulators. Unfortunately, all of that was underground, which meant Cass wouldn't be looking at the stars again any time soon. Not that he'd be able to see much through this atmosphere anyway. "'Check,' the other man said, turning his back to Cass. Making a quick scan of all the connection points and anything he might have missed, Cass cleared him. Looks good. My turn. Cass turned and felt the man tugging on his suit in different places. You're fine, the man said, and then hit the comm button at the front of the ship. Clear back here. All passengers, proceed to the exit. Watch your suit until fully cleared from the vehicle. Once outside, please move at least 20 meters away. The comm turned off and Cass felt the pull of atmosphere as the cabin was depressurized. The indicator light on his arm beeped in fast succession, 
indicating there was something wrong with his suit. He turned to see he hadn't properly secured one of the connectors on his oxygen system. Grimacing, Cass fixed the issue, silencing the indicator. You said I was clear, he said through the internal comm of the suit. The other man just turned to him and shrugged. Cass couldn't tell if he was incompetent or malicious. Either way, he wasn't looking forward to spending the next 18 months in Cathora with this man at his periphery. The side hatch of the ship opened, and two steps extended down. Cass allowed his friend to go first as they stepped out into the soupy mixture that was Cathora's atmosphere. Cass trotted to get out of the way in time before the shuttle lifted up, its pilot apparently impatient to return to Dren. Not that it was much better than here. He shielded his mask as a parade of rocks and debris peppered their suits from the shuttle's blast radius. Even though they were on a concrete pad, it seemed like no one ever came out to clean it off. It was littered with debris. He turned to see the other man already making his way in the opposite direction toward a large mountain face that bordered one side of the pad. Cass turned his eyes up to watch the shuttle disappear into the thick atmosphere, hoping to see at least a few defiant stars burning hot and bright enough that their light might penetrate down to him. But it was nothing but yellow and green. Sighing, Cass followed the man toward the mountain. Name? Cass's shuttle companion didn't look up at the lanky Durander standing before him with a piece of slate in his hand. The alien stood a meter taller than either of them, with his tripod legs taking up the bulk of his height. On top was a long torso with two arms and an elongated head punctuated by small eyes and a wide mouth. Cass had to admit he was surprised to see a Durander down here as well. Though it made sense, as their lungs were developed enough to process not only oxygen, but carbon dioxide, nitrogen, methane, and a few other heavy gases. He could step outside with nothing more than a thick jacket, and would be fine for at least a few hours. Cass glanced at the airlock, which had closed behind them. He'd taken careful notice of the entry and exit sequence. Jet. Cass snickered. Jet spun on him. Got a problem, Caspian? Cass shook his head, suppressing a smile. The Durander cleared his throat. You're assigned to Section 4. Head there, and Lura will assign you quarters and equipment. Jet nodded, disconnecting his helmet and pulling it off over his head. He gave Cass one last hard stare as he made his way into the base, following the signs directing him to Section 4. Even if this place was one of the less glamorous Coalition installations, it was still Coalition which meant no one would have a problem finding their way around. If there was one thing the Coalition loved, it was science explaining just how everything worked. Name? the Durander asked Cass. What? You don't recognize me? Cass asked. Why would I recognize you? Speak your name so I can confirm your voice print, he said, turning the slate slab toward him. On the surface, a series of Durander letters moved, as if it were a digital screen though each letter looked as if it had been carved into the slab, until it changed again. Rabo, Cass said, expecting some blowback. You're assigned to Section 7. Ruhe will assign you quarters and equipment. The Durander turned to his other duties, leaving him standing there. Thanks, Cass said, removing his helmet as well and following the appropriate signage. This might not be as bad as he thought, all he had to do was keep his head down until he could enact his plan, which meant blending in and staying low to the best of his ability. Ever since he'd heard the word parole, he'd been thinking about how best to use his good fortune. For that matter, he'd been thinking about this moment for the past two years, expecting a lot more time to work out the particulars. But he wasn't going to let it go to waste. Though here he'd have actual responsibilities again, more than likely, he'd be overseeing one of the mining units designed to pull all the cyclax they could out of Cathora's poisonous mountains, which would then be turned into hull plating for the newest Coalition ships once it had been sent to the processing center on Priocean 4. And all of that was fine, because it was nothing but temporary. With him, at that age, he hadn't even been planning to join the Sovereign Navy, much less finding himself on one of its mining worlds, overseeing the manual labor of 2,000 autonomous machines. 
Rather, he'd been planning a relatively comfortable life on Earth, staying out of the prying eyes of the Coalition's military wings, and instead devoting himself to some other pursuit. Acting, or maybe art. And then the hammer had come down, namely his father. He'd decided early on Cass was too lackadaisical, that he had little to no ambition. No son of Maxence Rabot would pursue art for a living. Not when the elder Rabot was not only one of the preeminent material scientists for the coalition, but also married to the chief engineer of the USCS Charybdis. Cass's mother had always been much easier on him. But because of her posting, she hadn't been around as much, leaving much of his rearing to his father. She'd be off in space for months at a time, only to return home for a few weeks before she was off on another assignment. And being admittedly spoiled, Cass had always seen a career as more of an option rather than a requirement. Ever since the early days, Earth had always been the glittering jewel of the Coalition, the centerpiece to which all the other worlds gazed, hoping one day their own worlds would achieve the same level of peace and tranquility, as many Coalition worlds did after a time. Which meant most of its citizens had the option to determine their life path, while many chose to serve the organization that had helped craft Earth into the paradise that it was, many others chose instead to enrich it through artistic expression. Painters, writers, weavers, and yes, even actors, all helped contribute to the rich tapestry of coalition society. Some would even argue they were as, if not more important, than the military wings, which maintained the peace throughout the many worlds of the coalition. And that had been the loose plan, in the back of his mind anyway. Maybe if things hadn't gone so wrong, Cass never would have found himself in the Sovereign Navy at all. The machine beside Cass beeped, and he flipped up his blast helmet to examine the readout. The autonomous mining robots, AMRs, had reached their desired depth for the day's work. He flipped the helmet back down and wiped the front of it with his gloved hand, the soot streaking across his visor in a ruddy mess. Cass hopped down off the control unit and approached the closest two machines, no surprises, he told them. We can't risk the structural stability of the mine, so keep it close and tight. Aye, sir, they both said simultaneously. Cass suppressed a shudder, the words reminding him of how his former crew used to address him. He'd been on Cathora less than two weeks, and already he was sick of the place, inside and out. The tall machines jogged off in the direction of their respective mines to join the others already in process their long limbs suited for crossing much larger distances. From what he'd understood, many of the machines that made it here to work had originally been requisitioned for combat, but due to an oversight, an additional 4,000 units had been unnecessarily produced. Instead of scrapping them all, the Coalition had retrofitted them with visors and faceplates of their own to keep Cathar's particulate dust from grinding their systems to a halt. Usually, when they came out of the mines, they were black from head to foot, carting their day's supply of cyclax. Cass was just glad it wasn't him down there. It was bad enough he had to stay up here in the staging area to oversee his four mines. To be that far beneath the surface sent shivers through his spine. Not much longer. All he had to do was wait for the perfect opportunity. And he'd been watching the rotation schedules for all incoming ships, he just needed to wait for the perfect moment before he put his plan into motion. Hey, Rabot! Cass grimaced, thankful his dust shield was covered in so much ore, Jet wouldn't be able to make out his facial features from so far away. The man held his hand up, grinning, and Cass couldn't help but notice some of the ore had deposited itself on his teeth. Jet, Cass said, wiping the dust shield again so he could check his monitor for the new depths. Jet walked up beside him, still grinning. Want to make a little wager? Cass suppressed the urge to roll his eyes. What sort of wager? End of day numbers. Lowest take has double cleaning duty for a week. Cass shook his head. You must think I'm a moron, he said. I know you're a moron. I'm just hoping you're as gullible as you are stupid. Cass shot him a sidelong look. Yeah, well, I already heard about your cyclax vein, so I don't think so. Jet laughed and slapped Cass in the back, shaking the dust from both of them. What had begun as icy indifference had morphed into what Cass could only assume was something less than mutual loathing. But it didn't hurt that he and Jet were the only two humans on this rock. 
The rest were either Durander or machines. According to Ruhe, humans transferred through every 100 to 200 days as the extended exposure to Cathora's elements, even inside the environmental simulators, wasn't exactly healthy. Before he'd seen it in person, Cass hadn't realized exactly how hazardous it was here. Perhaps if he'd paid more attention back in his elementary classes, he might have had a better idea of what he was getting himself into. Drinks after work? Jed asked. Sure. The bar on the second level where the habitation suites were located was probably the best part of working in this place. It seemed the Coalition wanted to keep its workers drunk or ignorant, and the bar was good for both at the same time. Because a comfortable worker was a silent worker. And in high-risk jobs like these, the last thing the Coalition wanted was to hear you complain. Cass understood why they assigned the job to parolees. And if they weren't working with such sensitive equipment, he could see lifelong prisoners working here as well. The agreement had been simple. Cass would perform supervised work for the Coalition for a period of nine months, after which he would be released under his own cognizance. After that, all he would need to do was provide monthly check-ins to his duty officer for the next five years. If everything went smoothly, he'd be able to come and go as he pleased. Cass couldn't help but wonder if Rutledge knew about this little deal. On first glance, it didn't seem possible. But then again, perhaps the whole thing was a test to see if Cass would try something stupid. But he hadn't spent two years in a cell waiting for an opportunity like this to blow it now. Maybe he'd have to serve out his entire term here, but as soon as he had the chance, he was going back to wait and exposing his former captain. It was the only path open to him, and the brakes would have to fall wherever they may. The Coalition had made a giant mistake in promoting him to Admiral, but Cass would take care of that as soon as humanly possible. But for now, it meant doing his job in the mines. Yo, Ziphead, you still with me? Jet's large hand waved in front of Cass's dust shield. He shook away the memories. Yeah, just distracted is all. That dust is getting to your brain. It does that, you know. I heard one of the Duranders talking about it. If your helmet isn't on tight, it will seep in through your ears and your nose and gather into the corners of your brain, where it sits eating away at your thoughts. Cass turned to him, his eyes wide with disbelief. Had Jet started drinking already? Crazy, right? All I'm saying is flush your system before you go to bed. You'll see I'm right. He snickered as he turned, headed back toward his own minds. See ya after work, he said without turning around, throwing his arm into the air in a half wave. Half a month. He'd been on Cathora mining every single day for half a month. Cass told himself if he could make it the entire 73 days that comprised a standard coalition month, he'd treat himself with one of the top-shelf dregs, though there was only two in this wretched place. But the days were getting to him. Wake up, eat his rations, oversee the AMR's mind cyclax all day, hit the bar for a drink with Jet, then go back to his suite to start it all over again. In many ways, it wasn't any different than his time on Dren, except... Here he was tired all the time, and he never could seem to get clean. Jet had been right about the dust. It permeated everywhere. Cass was feeling run down. It was much harder to be patient here than it had back in prison. For some reason, the days crawled, and at this rate, he'd go mad before he ever had a chance to make his case to the review boards on 8. Cass made his way through his assigned tunnels, glad to be done with the day's work. They were supposed to be getting a new shipment of AMRs in a few days, which were sorely needed. Half of his units had already seized up from the dust and were completely useless, which meant his numbers were off. And it wasn't as if he could get down there and pull the cyclax out himself. At those levels, everything was lethal. And unless the Durander expected him to be down there in a full enviro suit hacking away at the rock with an axe, there was little he could do but wait for new units. Cass climbed the short staircase to the half-suite level, with its graded floor suspended halfway up one of the larger caverns. The Coalition hadn't done much to make this place very cozy. He entered the airlock, which blasted him with four strong bursts of air to blow off most of the dust. 
not that it mattered much anyway, and then exited the other side. Who knew how many other humans had been here before him and Jet? How many different people had performed the same routine over and over again, all in the name of the Coalition? And where were they now? The bar sat to the right of the small area, its once white stool stained dark gray from the ever-present particulates. Removing his blast mask and shaking out his hair, Cass made his way over to his regular stool. Jet was already there, hunched over his drink like he was praying to it. Rough day? Cass asked, sliding on the stool. When Jet turned to him, Cass almost toppled back. Jet's face was white as a sheet, and his eyes were tinged red, as if he'd been crying. I think, Jet said, leaning forward, I think something's wrong. Cass reached out to hold him up, but the man fell to the side instead, landing on the floor with a thump. He began to convulse and retched all over the dirty floor. Cass hopped the bar and hit the emergency call button. Chapter 4 Two days after he'd watched Jet being carted off to the Durander section of the base, a feeling of deep unease had grown within Cass. Despite his questioning, none of the Durander had answered any of his questions other than to assure him Jet was fine but would not be returning to work. More humans were scheduled to arrive next week to take their positions, and until then he was to work as if nothing had happened. The same Durander who had greeted him on the first day, who he learned was named Marhua, reminded Cass of the terms of his parole. He seemed to be the one in charge and was around more than the others, but for the most part it had just been Cass and the robots under his watch. All of Jet's models had been temporarily shut down until the replacement overseer arrived. But something about this situation didn't feel right to Cass. He didn't know much about the Durander people beyond their physical abilities, which he'd heard about ever since he'd entered the Academy. They were some of the most resilient and strong members of the Coalition, their bones and muscles five to ten times sturdier than those of a normal human. And he'd had the chance to listen to one speak once his first year at the Academy. But other than that, his exposure to them had been limited. What struck him as odd about the three that operated this place was none of them seemed to emote any kind of concern for Jet. Hell, Cass didn't like the guy, but still he wanted to know if he was going to be okay. And for the first few days, Cass brushed it off, telling himself that the Durander had examined Jet. They had been the ones to come and collect him from the bar, after all, and they knew he would be fine. So then why did he feel like something else was going on? Why had his request to see Jet been denied? Marhua had been confused as to why Cass would want to see him anyway. Jet was a criminal. There was no sense in associating with him any longer. To which Cass didn't have a good answer. But maybe this whole mess with Rutledge had made him more paranoid than usual. After all, he had just spent two years inside a cell for a crime he didn't commit. And the fact that he'd gotten out so early was strange as well. And he wasn't going to let anyone just tell him what he wanted to hear anymore. He was going to see it with his own eyes. Which was why he had bypassed the Durander security protocol and snuck into their side of the base. The first thing he'd noticed about the corridor as he made it past the Durander airlock was it was near pristine. Hardly a speck of dust anywhere. On one hand, this made sense. The Durander didn't work down as close to the mines as he and the AMRs did, though they were still exposed to the same elements. Maybe their airlock filters were better than his own, seeing as a Durander could withstand more punishment from a cleansing cycle than a human could. Cass had made sure to turn it off when he disabled the rest of the protocol. He didn't need to make a lot of noise as he broke into their side of the base. This also meant he was at risk for tracking in his own dirt, but it couldn't be helped. He hadn't expected it to be so clean in here, and there was nothing he could do about it now. Cass made his way down the triangular-shaped corridor. Every few meters, there was another partition, but he couldn't discern any particular need for them other than aesthetic. He wasn't even sure what he was looking for. All of the doors were much taller than he was used to, in order to accommodate the Durander's elongated shapes. He'd made sure to choose a time when he was fairly certain he wouldn't run into any of them. Marhua was at the front gate, awaiting the new shipment of AMRs, 
while Lura and Ruhei were supposed to be resting in their quarters. He needed to be quick if he wanted to find Jet. All he needed to do was make sure the man wasn't terminally ill, and then he could return to his own quarters. But Marhua hadn't offered any reason as to Jet's collapse, other than to say he'd been working too hard. Cass knew that much had been a lie. After he found that Cyclax vein, he'd had it easy. All he had to do was put up his feet and let the AMRs do all the work. No, something else was going on. Crossing to the other side of the corridor, Cass tried to decipher what was on each of the doors, but as it was written in Durander, there was little chance of coming up with anything. He hadn't even bothered with an elective language in his primary school or the academy. With translators doing most of the work, what was the need? He sure wished he'd had one now. He had little choice. He'd have to break into one of these rooms if he was going to get any answers. It wouldn't be difficult, just as it wasn't for the airlock. Either the Durander didn't know he was a skilled engineer, or they didn't care. If they had, they would have installed more safeguards, though Cass would have been able to break through those in time as well. Working with systems wasn't like trying to read another language. Mechanics had a language all their own, and once you understood it for one species, you could understand it for all. And for some reason, this was the thing most of his fellow engineers never seemed to grasp. Or maybe it was just him. Maybe that's what made him so good at his job, at his former job. Cass popped the small panel off the door and examined the components inside. It seemed like a simple enough job, and there were no alarms attached, which made things easier. The only problem was, if this room belonged to one of the other two Durander, he might need to come up with a quick explanation. Cass began rerouting the components. How did that old saying go? Nothing ventured? Just as Cass had moved the first chipset, a door three partitions down opened. Alarmed, Cass pressed himself to the door he was working on as flat as he could, hoping the partitions blocked him from view. Had he accidentally tripped something at the door itself? He didn't think so. If he had, it was something he'd never seen before. So much for being a great engineer. All he could hear were the murmur of voices, and they seemed to be growing more distant. Cass peeked out from behind the partition to see both Lura and Ruhe walking away from him. Over her shoulder, Lura carried a very human-shaped form inside a canvas bag, and Cass had to blink a few times to make sure he was actually seeing what he thought he was seeing. That couldn't be Jet, could it? There weren't any other people on this station. It had just been the two humans and the three Durander. If it wasn't Jet, then who or what could it be? The bag bobbed along as Lura walked on her three legs, speaking in low tones to Ruhe, and it looked suspiciously like a body. It was too much for Cass to handle. He had to know what was in that bag. He moved quietly around the partitions, doing his best to keep up with them and remain silent. Being as tall as they were, not to mention aided by a third leg, they moved fast. Though for them it was probably a normal pace. Cass couldn't make out what they were saying to each other. Without the aid of a translator, he'd never managed to pick it up. But from their tone, he could discern whatever had happened wasn't anything out of the ordinary. They were both relaxed and didn't seem to be in any panic. All of which only made him feel worse. At the end of the hall was a larger door than all the others, and the two Durander approached it before Ruhe placed his hand to the sensor on the side. The door slid open, and they disappeared inside, the door closing behind him. Cass took the opportunity to sprint down the remainder of the hall, no longer bothering to be quiet. He needed to get into that room. As he reached the door, he began to inspect the pad Ruhe had placed his hand on. It was a standard palm scanner, probably keyed to Durander DNA only. It should be easy enough for Cass to bypass, given some time. But before he could, voices spoke on the other side of the door, and Cass jumped to the side, pressing himself against the wall again. The door slid open as Lura and Ruhe exited, their heads close as they continued to speak, paying Cass no attention. He didn't think they'd seen him. They'd been too involved in their conversation. Taking his chance, Cass moved around the edge of the door while it was still open, and just made it inside before the door slid shut behind him.
The room was dark, lit only by a few lights from high above, and it took his eyes a moment to adjust. As he became used to the darkness, he could make out humanoid shapes in the room, and for a moment he thought he'd accidentally stumbled into a secret meeting room of some kind. But it soon became apparent the shapes weren't moving. Instead, they all seemed suspended from long chains that disappeared up toward the ceiling. Each was wrapped in a canvas bag, just like the one Lura had carried inside. There had to be hundreds of them, all lined up in perfect rows going back into the room as far as Cass could see. Closer to the front of the room, there were at least a dozen chains without a shape, though the chains ended with a giant hook, all of them stained with a dark substance. Cass closed his eyes a moment and prayed he was wrong about this place. One of the shapes swayed on its chain, and Cass approached it, holding it steady. His heart thrummed in his chest, because even though he'd expected the worst, he didn't want to confirm it. Taking three deep breaths, and noticing the air had a musty quality to it, unlike anywhere else on the base, Cass began to unwrap the canvas from around the figure's head. He had a little trouble getting it around the chain hooked into the back of the bag itself. Cass pulled the bag away, and nearly threw up as the smell hit him. In the brief moment before he turned away, he confirmed what he already suspected. Covering his mouth, he turned back to see the skeletal face of Jet staring back at him, his eyes gone from their sockets. His face was gaunt, as if he hadn't eaten anything in months, and his skin was a pale shade of gray. Had he not known better, he would have said the man had been dead months, not days. Dropping the bag and focusing on keeping his lunch down, Cass moved to another figure. As he unwrapped this one, the canvas came off much easier. When he pulled it away, the face of a woman stared back at him, her dark hair cascading down her shoulders. Though the head it was attached to was little more than a skeleton, her mouth agape, as if Cass had caught her unaware. What the fuck was going on here? When people died on the job... Did the Durander just leave them here to rot? Cass was about to replace the bag over her head when he noticed a small piece of metal above her right eye. He recognized it as an ocular implant. It was a newer design, too, not more than three or four years old. Something about it tugged at his memory, and all of a sudden he remembered. Catherine Collins, the cartographer. He'd followed her work for years... She'd been one of the preeminent cartographers for the Coalition. That was, until she was discovered to have been selling her maps to the Erians. She'd pled guilty at the trial, and had been guaranteed leniency. But Cass had lost track of her after that. Had she ended up here as well, mining Cyclax? Was this what happened to every Coalition member who was granted parole? Were they all sent to Cathora to die a meaningless death? And what killed them? Could Jet have been right? Could it have been something to do with the dust? Cass stared at the hundreds of bodies hanging in the room. He needed to get off this rock immediately. Chapter 5 It had been six hours since Cass had found Jet's remains. He'd made it back to his own quarters without incident. Apparently, Lura and Ruhe had returned to wherever they'd been before carting Jet's body to the catacombs, as Cass now called the horror show he'd found down there. And over those six hours, Cass had tried to contemplate how the Coalition could either be so blind it didn't know what was happening here, or that the corruption he'd seen firsthand must run deeper than he'd ever imagined. He imagined trying to explain what was happening on Cathora to a Coalition board, only for them to confirm that, yes, they knew about it, and what exactly did he want them to do about it? There was no way they didn't know. Wouldn't someone think it was odd the people they assigned to this planet never left? Surely the three Durander couldn't have orchestrated this trap without some help. The pilot who brought the parolees here must be in on it, which would mean the distributors on Axis 5 had to know something was going on as well. And to that end, the parole review board who had questioned him on Dren would have at least a suspicion, since none of their parolees ever returned. So there was a good chance the Coalition did know what was going on, and they were content to let it happen, 
It didn't surprise him no one questioned what happened to these criminals, with trillions upon trillions of life forms in the coalition. Who was going to pay attention to a few hundred criminals? Convicted criminals at that. Had this been the reason for his parole? To get him out of the way and keep him quiet? Rutledge must have known after all. Hell, he probably approved the transfer himself. After all, he'd been the reason Cass was in jail in the first place. One thing was for sure. Cass wasn't dying here. If the dust really had killed Jed, then Cass needed to limit his exposure and get the hell out of here as soon as possible. His only option was the transport delivering the new AMRs, which, thanks to Marhua's grumblings about it being late, was due to arrive any minute, which meant it was his one opportunity to get out of this place. Consequences be damned. He wouldn't be able to stay in the coalition. That much was evident, especially not if they were trying to kill him. But he could worry about that later. Right now, he had to focus on getting out. As soon as he'd returned to his hab suite, Cass had scrubbed himself like never before in the shower, taking extra care to clean his skin as thoroughly as possible. No matter what he seemed to do, dark gray seemed to continue to run down the drain. But he didn't stop. He only continued to clean as best he could, turning the water as hot as he could stand it. When he was done and his skin was tinged pink, he found his cleanest set of clothes and prepped his enviro suit he brought with him from the transport ship. At the very least, he could still limit his current exposure. It took him twenty minutes to put the suit back on and make sure all the connections were secure. But when he checked his filters, he found they were filthy. Apparently, sitting in his room for weeks, the suit had collected its own particulate matter. The last thing Cass wanted to do was breathe more of the stuff in from a contaminated filter. But he didn't have much choice. Going to the surface without a suit was suicide. He'd just have to hope breathing the stuff in for a few minutes wouldn't be terminal. As he was double-checking the last few connections on the suit, his door chimed, stopping Cass in his tracks. He wasn't due to start his shift for another fifteen minutes, and if all went to plan, he'd be on the transport and off this rock by then. Cass pressed his finger to the small pad beside the door. Yeah? With the new arrivals, we need you at your station now, Ruhe's voice said from the other side of the door. The new units require processing. He had to think fast. He hadn't expected to be called in early to work. Yeah, I was just about to call Marhua. I'm not feeling well and need to take the day. What do you mean? Are you dizzy? Cold to the touch? Ruhe asked. He seemed giddy. Cass cursed the Durander. Bloodthirsty bastard. He just wanted Cass to die so he could hang him up on one of his hooks, like Cass was the most recent acquisition in his collection. Yeah, something like that, Cass said, producing a fake cough. He reached over and grabbed the spanner he used to calibrate the machines down near the mines. The door opened without his permission, and Ruhe stood here, hunger in his eyes. But as soon as he saw Cass suited up, his eyes went wide with surprise. Cass gritted his teeth and swung the spanner so it hit Ruhe dead center of his knee joint and his front leg. Ruhe looked at him with pity as Cass swung it again, and this time the knee shattered. He let out an ear-splitting yell as the leg buckled and he fell into the room, almost crushing Cass. Positioning himself over the fallen alien, Cass broke the other two knees, then pushed Ruhe into the room, then grabbed his helmet. How? Ruhe asked in a whimper, holding the first knee Cass had broken. Normally, he shouldn't have been able to break the joint due to the strength of Durander bones. But Cass had made a small modification to the spanner so that it vibrated at an almost imperceptible frequency when swung. It had been the first thing he'd done after returning from the catacombs, and it had taken him close to three hours to finish the modifications. The vibrations were designed to send microscopic shockwaves through the surface being impacted, weakening its integrity. The second hit was what really did it, amplifying the first by a factor of four. In theory, Cass should be able to break almost anything with enough hits in a row. Ingenuity, he replied, shutting the door behind him and locking the Durander inside. Helmet in one hand and spanner in the other, Cass crept along the walls, making his way to the short staircase where he peeked over to see if either of his other two captors was waiting for Ruhe's return.
Seeing no one on the pad below, he crept down, making his way toward the main airlock. Would Marhua have transferred all the robots into the facility already? Or would it take longer? Cass wasn't even sure how many would be arriving. All he was sure of was he couldn't let that ship go without being on it. Keeping as quiet as he could, he moved along the rock walls of the base, keeping a sharp ear for anything out of the ordinary. All he could hear was the low rumble of the enviro generators that were always present. He reached the final bend and peered around the edge to see Marhua standing with a slate board in hand counting AMRs as they came through the airlock one by one. Cass took three deep breaths and put his helmet on, locking it down and trying not to think about the poison he was about to inhale. He gripped the spanner hard in his gloved hand. He'd have to be quick. Just as he was about to step out from behind the corner, an arm landed on his shoulder, spinning him around, and Cass found himself face to face with Lura. What's the meaning? she began, before Cass struck her torso with a spanner. She flinched, and he swung again, but she blocked the hit and shoved him back, sending him sprawling into the middle of the concourse. Marhua glanced up and stopped counting, the AMR stopping in their tracks. Rabo? Marhua said. What? He's trying to escape, Lura said. He just attacked me. The last words on her lips faltered, and she bent over, her facial features squeezed together as she held her side where Cass had hit her. What? She began, before toppling over. Cass scrambled up and grabbed the spanner, making a mad dash for the airlock. No, this is against coalition procedure, Marhua said as Cass ran toward him. You can't leave. Cass stopped a few feet from the Durander. Let me guess. No one leaves. I found your crypt. Understanding dawned on Marhua's face. That explains the dust. I wondered how it got in there. Regardless, you must serve out your full parole. And die in the process like Jet and Collins? I don't think so. He held the spanner tighter. It's unfortunate what happened to them, but it was not intentional. Anyone who survives their parole period is free to leave after their work is completed. He took a step toward Cass. Has anyone ever survived? The Durander paused. No, but we're hopeful it will happen one day. And the Coalition sanctions this? Of course. Why else would they station us here? If they didn't care what happened to you, they'd let you rot in jail. Cass gritted his teeth. Get out of my way, Marhua. This is one human who isn't becoming part of your sick collection of failures. The physically superior alien stood his ground. You don't understand. Your term isn't up. You can't leave. If you survive your term, then we'll talk. Cass was holding the spanner so tight he could feel the minute vibrations even through his suit, a suit that was causing him to breathe in more poison dust by the minute. He glanced at the half a dozen AMR standing off to the side of the airlock, watching him passively. They would be his only chance. Machines, begin mining protocol four, he said, bracing himself against the wall. The six machines' yellow eyes blinked in unison, and they crouched down and began to rip and pull at the floor plating, sending reverberations throughout the room. Marhua turned to tell them to stop when Cass rushed him, jumping with all his force and slamming the spanner against the side of the tall Durander's head. Marhua dropped his slate and whipped his arm around, knocking Cass back against the wall. Cass felt the air rush out of him in a single gasp, and it was all he could do to keep from blacking out as he fell to the ground. There's a reason they stationed us here and not a bunch of humans, Marhua said. Because when it comes to policing the prisoners, we are much more capable. He walked over to Cass, his three legs moving in perfect unison. Behind him, the machines continued to grip and pull at the floor plating. I hate it has to end this way. But you're not the first to try and escape, and I'm sure you won't be the last. He reached out with his long arm, but stopped short of grabbing Cass's suit by the neck. Instead, he gripped the side of his head. Just like with Lura, the vibrations had taken a moment to multiply through his system. Cass may not have been able to deal a fatal blow, but they should at least give him a debilitating headache. 
Marhua let out a scream as he held both sides of his head and fell to his three knees. Cass got to his feet as fast as he could, glancing over at Lura, who was attempting to stand again, watching him with fire in her eyes. Cass limped to the airlock, pressing the activate button to exit. The system locked him in and drained all the oxygen from the space before opening the other side. A hundred meters away sat the transport ship, with a line of machines streaming from it, all of them standing in place. None of them paid Cass any attention as he limped past them, daring not to look back. If either of the Durander made it out here, they'd kill him in an instant. Of that much he was sure. Finally, Cass reached the ship itself, where only four robots remained on board, including one of the pilot's seat. Machines, exit, Cass ordered, sliding down into the co-pilot's seat. Three of the four remaining machines proceeded down the ramp while the pilot didn't move. Didn't you hear me? Exit. The machine stayed put. Whatever. He didn't have time to argue with a machine. Instead, he studied the panels, only to realize the controls were completely foreign to him. He'd taken a few piloting classes in the academy, but had flunked out in his sophomore year from any kind of advanced flight training. He just didn't have the aptitude for it. He'd hoped there would have been an organic pilot he could have bartered with, or even threatened to fly him into non-aligned space. But with nothing but a machine behind the controls, he didn't have a choice. Can you get us out of here? Cass asked the machine sitting to his left. Through the windscreen, Cass saw Lura exit the airlock on the other side of the landing pad. As fast as possible. Yes, the machine responded, its yellow eyes blinking at him. Then do it. The machine jumped on the controls, and before Cass knew what was happening, the ship had blasted off the pad, the last robot on the ramp falling off as the ship flew away. The ramp! Close the ramp! The machine reached over and tapped a button in front of Cass, the ramp retracting as the door closed. Far below, he could see Lura staring up at them. There was no way this wasn't getting back to Coalition Central. Epilogue So, Cass said, walking back into the cockpit after getting the suit off and adjusting the enviro controls to produce an oxygen atmosphere so he wouldn't suffocate. The machine kept his eyes trained on the controls in front of him. Had the ship's pilot had one of the blast shields like the rest of the AMRs? He couldn't be sure. That was some fancy flying for a box of bolts. The machine didn't respond. Not much on personality, are you? Still nothing. Do you have an automatic recall or some security feature that makes you alert the Coalition to this situation? No. Cass glanced over the machine's shoulder, then fell back into the co-pilot's seat. He was exhausted. That's good. What's our heading? Back to Axis 5 for reassignment. Let's try somewhere new. Point us in the direction of Arkengali. Arkengali is firmly within Sargan space. Cass side-eyed the machine. I know that. But unless you haven't noticed, I'm a fugitive. I can't exactly go back to the Coalition and tell them it was all a big mistake. Why not? Because they just throw me right back in Cathora. Or maybe just shoot me. Who knows anymore? Point is... I can't go back. Ever. The machine didn't respond, except to input new heading coordinates. You know, I've never seen anyone pull off a pad like that. How long have you been piloting? And who programmed you? The machine hesitated for a brief second. I was programmed at the municipal structure fields on Beta Leona 7, Griffin City, Eastern Continent. Cass leaned forward, trying to see the machine's face. He couldn't be sure, but he thought its voice might have just wavered. Programmed to pilot? The machine hesitated. Yes? You're lying. Incorrect. Machines do not lie. His voice was solid now, but Cass knew something was off. This was one of the mining bots that should have been assigned to him. Its serial number was printed on the back of its right shoulder and he caught it as he came back into the cockpit. For some reason, this machine had the capability to deceive.
something he'd never heard of before. If you say so, Cass said, relaxing back into the seat. He wasn't about to argue. As far as he could tell, he just hit the jackpot. But the coalition would come after him unless he found protection somewhere. Unfortunately, the best place would be to hide in the Sargan Commonwealth, a faction that had broken off the coalition a millennia ago and established their own collective in adjacent space. Today, they were a serious power in the area and had zero love for the coalition. If anyone could help him, they could. Just make sure you don't change that heading on me while I'm asleep. Cass stood to go lie down on one of the shelves in the back compartment, a shelf that had very recently held a mining robot. How do you know I won't? the machine asked. Because I don't think you want to go back to the Coalition any more than I do, Cass smirked. For the first time in two years, it looked like his gambit had finally paid off. It was time to start over. Thank you for listening to Caspian's Gambit, an Infinity's End story, by Eric Warren. Narrated by Larry Gorman. Copyright 2019 by Eric Warren. Production copyright 2021 by Eric Warren. To continue the story in the Infinity's End series, please visit ericwarrenauthor.com or Google Eric Warren Author to find a list of all the Infinity's End books available on audio. Also, keep a lookout for future installments, as this universe is always expanding.